Welcome to Understanding Project Management Discussions. My name is Dave Barrett, and my guest today is Rich Crowley. I've known Rich for a number of years. We both started in uh, a company, Mutual Life, uh, many years ago, in the uh, mid to late 80s, uh, to be exact. And both Rich and I were young software developers at the time. Now, Rich worked uh, for the organization for a few years, uh, but then I think he wanted to go on and do other things, worked for uh, a software startup, and eventually uh, struck out on his own and has been a um, contract project manager for over 20 years and has worked at many organizations. I've always found Rich to have a, a unique view of project management. He thinks about things in very interesting ways. Our topic today is the area of project schedules. So please welcome Rich Crowley. Hey Rich, how's it going? Good Dave, how are you? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. Um, so today's, uh, today's discussion is regarding project scheduling. So you've had, I think, a, 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 a lot of experience on different types of projects. Uh, so, so I guess my, my first uh, question is like, what, what type of scheduling have you done? Can you provide us kind of an overview of that? Yeah, I, I've, I've probably you know, done a full gambit in terms of, you know, I've been at this a long time now. So um, probably the most common tool that I've used is, is Microsoft Project. I mean, most of the companies that I've worked in are large enough. They've got Microsoft Office as their suite and Project, you know, is a, a pretty commonplace tool, pretty standard Gantt chart. You can break things down a bunch of ways according to, you know, project life cycles or something custom for whatever you're working on. Um, so that's been sort of my, my go-to. There's, there's lots of places that, um, what, what I found with, with project is that it's a project manager's tool. So it, it's a tool that doesn't, I find, um, cater well to the people that, that you're building the schedule for. Um, and so that's probably been my biggest challenge with it. Um, you know, which kind of begs the question, well, why, why do we build a schedule? Right, and, and who do we build it for? And, and yeah, so what I found is that there's so many different um, constituents that you build the project for that the output isn't necessarily something that Microsoft Project is good for, right? right. But you, know, you, can, you can take a high level and throw it into a spreadsheet and it works quite well for some audiences. Um, but anyway, that, that sort of Gantt linear little downward things to the right worked well for a lot of different use cases, but, but certainly in the new world where everything's agile, everything, you know, the, the, the Gantt became sort of the, the antichrist of, of tools and that methodology. So, you know, I have used, um, you know, scrum boards and Kanban as well for trying to schedule work. And, and I shouldn't say schedule so much as plan work. Um, and it has a whole, there's a whole bunch of merits to that approach as well, which I really like. I'm just not sure they serve kind of senior project stakeholders as well. Because typically in anywhere you go, it's the person paying for it saying, well, what are we going to be done? Right, or here's when you need to be done. Can you hit that date and for this price? Right, right. So how do you bridge that gap between, you said you use MS Project a fair bit and you use yeah. some other agile tools, but what, what do you communicate to your, to your, your managers and uh, project sponsor and so on? Well, I, I think what I've seen is sort of, sort of an evolution and I've, I've been at this probably kind of pure project management work for, for 15 years where I've just done project management gigs. Um, probably the last seven or eight years I've seen there's more um, more of a standard sort of governance uh, approach and certainly the financial companies I work with that you've got you know steering committees and executive steering committees and oversight committees and, and they tend to work from PowerPoint largely right it's it's regular meetings every week every two weeks every month and you've got to give an update on on the project so you tend to get into things like you know schedule and budget and and, and scope um, and so you definitely don't produce a Gantt chart for that group like it's, you end up with a boiled down set. It can be, you know, it can be a PowerPoint slide, which has the high level milestones, which, you know, are really mapping to what you've got in your detailed Gantt chart. Or it can be a spreadsheet that sort of summarizes that and you know, you're copying and pasting it. Um, but it's, it's a much more aggregated view to what the deliverables are. So I, I would say to the senior audiences, what you're trying to do is 
translate your, your schedule into something more business deliverable-ish, right? So they're not speaking developer task or QA task. They want to know has a component been delivered or an element of functionality, or if we've broken it into phases, the project phases, when are I getting those deliverables? So yeah, you just boil it up and try to visually represent it as best you can. Right. I want to go back to a previous uh, comment that you said, and that, and and basically that Gantt charts, like the you know the the, the Gantt chart is is the great unwanted versus the uh, um, you know Scrum boards and so on are 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 the the, the new kid in town. So to speak. But how does you square that with you also said the thing that your sponsor wants to continually know is when will we be done which is what Gantt charts attempt to answer, not always successfully, yeah. and what scrum boards don't, you know, right. because they're, they're more adaptive and so on. How do you square those? Like those, it sounds like a collision between what we want to schedule in as teams and what our, what our customer wants. Uh, you know, my answer is you, you don't, but that, that answer is not that you can't, it's, it's that you don't or I haven't. I, I haven't been able to square them. I, I, I still do probably, you know, 70% of my work is done using kind of that traditional Gantt, you know, little, little set of rectangles that go downwards to the right across time versus the Scrum board. But, but you know, one of the things I've seen with, with Scrum is that you actually, you can do a decent job of trying to take, you know, uh, I'll, I'll call it a chunk of scope, right? So if you're building a widget, and a widget is a fairly big thing in this case, right? Um, you can, and if you had two week sprints, right? And so you're really focused on the next sprint or two, you can, you can build a big project backlog in a scrum board that has 200 elements of subscope and say, gee, you know, right up front, we'll try and deliver 10 elements of subscope per two week cycle. And that's gonna take, you know, what's, what's what did I say, 20? Yeah, 10, 10, 10 items per, per two week cycle. You're gonna need 20 weeks or whatever it is to, to get to 20 weeks worth of work is going to give you um, you know, those 200 items of scope. And so you've got a five month project. So you can sort of lay out, um, we need 10 sprints of two weeks. Right. Um, so, so you can square it a little bit that way. The, the danger with doing that is that you're forcing Agile into a waterfall approach. Right. And so I think it destroys the value that you'll get that, that is at the heart of Agile if you try to do that. And I think that's the struggle with most organizations claiming we're going Agile. Oh, look, we've got 10 sprints in two weeks. It's just waterfall then. Like, right. don't just, do it that way if you're doing that. Yeah, yeah you're, you're taking that that adaptive and, and making it predictive. Like, you're, right. you're just yeah. pushing it back. In, in you really are. Right? Yeah. And, and so there's, there's, all good, there's all kinds of good things that you'll get behaviors of saying, let's try to work in sprints um, where you've got, um, you know, because to me, the, the agile experiences I've had is that it's, it's a very self-managed team approach, right? And so, you know, give, give a team two weeks and say, you guys figure out what you can accomplish in two weeks, then we're gonna do it all again for the next two weeks. There's real goodness in that, you know, in daily standups and getting people to be accountable for managing the board, which is the planning, the basis of the planning work, getting them to do that. Whether you'll get everything done in 10 two week sprints or not is a different question. Right. You, you can do very good work in an agile way, but will you get done and so then you don't bridge the gap of, let's say it, it really does take 30 weeks. So it's 15 weeks in, you got people going, what the hell, this agile thing doesn't work, right? Like what, we said 20 weeks up front and well, the team never did that, right? It was like, no, we started working in two week sprints. We think now it's gonna take 30 weeks. Right. Yeah, so I, I think that's where I've had good success over the last five, maybe six, seven years where organizations are doing, they're trying to make the conversion. And so I act as translator. Like we can, we can take teams, whether they're IT teams or combinations of IT business teams working together in, I'll say an agile way, sprints with you know, two week, three week planning, planning cycles, um, you know, scrum board, Kanban board, um, all that sort of thing. And yet still having a lens on, you know what, the folks paying the bills here saying they really want this by third quarter, right? And, and sort of me extrapolating what we're seeing on the board to the high level deliverables that we need to get to, to meet the, Right. So I sort of combining both of those words. Yeah. One question I have, and this is something that, you know, is sort of bridging the gap between sort of theory and, and practice. So I want to get your perspective on this is in theory. And when we teach MS project and, you know, in textbooks and so on, uh, 
in, in MS project, it tracks costs. So you put in your resources and you put in the, the daily rate and the cost per use and so on. And then MS project uh, uh, spits out the, the, the costs in, in, in reports and so on. At least in my experience, I haven't run into that very much. That the costs are usually in 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 my you know uh, pre college experience, there was some separate spreadsheet that was balancing the books. What's what's your take on that? What what's your experience been in that area? Hundred percent the same. And you know, again, I've been at this a long time across a bunch of different companies, big and small. Um, I've I've literally never seen it done once, not once. Um, you know, we're we, you know, we have rates established. Like, I like the notion that you can, the closest I got to it was we had a big common set of resources set up in a Microsoft project um, file, which was just the resource pool. And then we had a bunch of other file-based um, projects themselves that pointed at the common resource pool. Um, we had rates assigned to those resources, notionally, to sort of line up with the IT chargeback rates. But to me, it just, it, it's, it, it, we, we didn't follow it to that length because ultimately most places have a time charging system that's independent of Microsoft project, right? So you, you end up, yeah, there's a separate financial reporting structure for the companies that actually report people's time. Some of them don't even report it. So maybe project would be a better mechanism. But what I've also seen is that even if that was the case, the, the whole notion of a Gantt, the project never executes the way the Gantt gets drawn. And, and that's the challenge, right? Like I, what, one of the main, one of my main, um, underlying principles of, of being a project manager is, and there's a quote, I think it's an Eisenhower quote, and he said, um, plans are useless, but planning is essential, right? And the whole notion of, gee, you know, the, the, the battle, the, 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 the best battle plan never survives the first 15 minutes of battle, right? Because you're always reacting once you get in. So we, we tend to build a Microsoft project plan that breaks things down into chunks one after the other, you know, some dependencies, there might be some things going on in parallel. And then ultimately, as you get further into a project, even a small project, you have everything executing all at once, right? At, at the tail end of your development and testing cycles, when you go, ooh, we've got a defect here. Oh, we have to redesign that piece. And you got two weeks to go or four weeks to go or two months to go on a big project. You end up back doing requirements, design, development, and testing, all that stuff, arguably all which are part of the life cycle development, all late in the cycle. And so it isn't, then it gets really messy. So you have everything overlaps at the end. And so trying to figure out, oh, what was the cost of development versus what was the cost of, yeah, I just, I, I've never seen it happen. I wouldn't want to have to do it. I would rather try for its side. Right. It's interesting you bring up that quote because I've, I've looked at that as well too and talked about it in some of my classes as well. Does that though mean we like what's the practical sort of upshot of that of that that uh you know that plans are useless but planning is indispensable does that mean that we shouldn't bother with like do you take from that or should we take from that that yeah let's let's let, let's forget this whole schedule nonsense this whole gantt chart thing is out she goes like what is is that the lesson or is it something deeper no you know? I, I think it i don't think that's the lesson at all i i i really like the notion that um you know and, and and someone early on in my career had suggested to me that you know the the biggest value in the plan is it gives you something to change manage against so you, you do have to have a plan you have to make your best guess and it could be wildly wrong or or even a little bit wrong or, or somewhere in between, but at least it, you can say, hmm, well, here's how we set this thing up originally. We had big chunk of work, you know, three, A, B, and C. And we said, let's do A first. It's gonna get done quickest. Then we'll focus on B and C at the same time. And if A comes off the rails, you, you get to three months into it, scratch your chin and go, hey, everybody, this was how we were going to do this. And look, it's chaos. A is gonna take longer than we thought. And so I think it's, I always, <laughs> You know, the, the whole notion of why do we build a schedule? One of the prime reasons I build one is for self-defense. Honestly, mm -hmm. the, 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 in my role, there's an expectation that there's a really good plan. Like we have to follow and execute to the plan. And I'm like, well, you could have a really good plan, but, but executing to it is very difficult, even in a project that goes well. So, but I think, you, you know, when projects go badly, one of the first things that happens is, well, you know, what did we have in the plan? Why didn't we plan for this? Um, are we not executing according to the plan? You know, what's, what's wrong with our planning? Is it planning? Is it execution? If you don't have 
a good solid plan written down, you will get eaten up, regardless of whether the plan was actually had ever had a chance of being um, reasonably executed. It, it does right. give you the ability to say, listen, we all agreed to this. Look, here's what it was. We agreed that this was a little ambiguous or not. And that's the other thing I think that, that really um, is important when you, when you set up any kind of a plan. It's, some projects have a much higher degree of ambiguity in them than others. You know, in today's world, if you, were, if you were in a company that had a good team of .NET developers or a good web development core, and you just had to extend an application by adding some functionality to it, you've done it before, you've got tools, you know the business, it's 300 days of work or 500 days of work, and you just you write it down. And you know that's easier than saying, we've never done a data analytics project before or written a machine learning algorithm where the project is actually data-driven as opposed to functionality-driven. Mm -hmm. And so the degree of ambiguity in your plan is something that, um, or in your schedule is something that, you know, you can highlight up front to the people that you're executing the project for, which kind of brings me to the other thing I'd like to call out about, you know, what's really important in a schedule is that you have to tie it back to something higher than that um, in order to manage successfully. And, you know, in the, in the waterfall world, it was sort of the charter, right? Charter lays out the scope and it does give you a synopsis of your plan and your budget and your resourcing. But I always, the way I try to execute is put sort of a strategy in place. And strategy is an overused word, but it does speak to things that I mentioned a moment ago. Like if there's five chunks to the project, which order do you do them in, right? And are you doing them because of, oh, we've only got this resource for the next six months, then they're going on leave. Or gee, this is the riskiest portion of our infrastructure we have to get off of. We should do that piece first. So this, I call that kind of the project execution strategy. And if you can get agreement on on some of those elements of how you will do your scope, that you can then take those agreements and consensus from your stakeholders and translate it into a schedule. If you try to do the opposite, just write down a schedule and say, here's the plan, let's get started. But you haven't got agreement on whether A should come before B, uh, you've, got, you've got more chaos in your timeline, regardless of whether it's ambiguous or not. Right. Yeah, that's right. No, it's a good point. And then I like that, you know, sort of when you said getting agreement, you know, getting that high level agreement strategy, whatever we want to call it is, is, right. is, is fundamental. And, and just, you know, again, tying back to the managers and, and stakeholders and so on in the company, that's, that's absolutely agreed. So, so, um, so yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting points. Is there, just as we're, we're kind of winding down in time, is any other uh, any other points that you had on your list of, of things to talk about with regard? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things that, that I think are kind of two more points I, I'd want to make. One, one is that, you know, who do we build the plans for? Well, certainly it's the, if you're the PM, it's sort of the, you're managing up to your, your stakeholders that are the ones that are paying the bills and they're the ones who are getting stuff from the project. Then there's the people executing the tasks. And, and the other thing, speaking to Microsoft Project is, a developer, a tester, a business analyst, a business SME, they tend not to want to read a Gantt chart, right? I mean, if it's got everyone's tasks listed there in what order, they're worried about their own work. Now, mm -hmm. the more senior people on the project, the leads, so if it's the test lead or the developer, they may want to say, what are my three developers working on? But, right. but they tend to, and those people are the busiest ones. They're your most experienced. They, don't, they have less time to read the Gantt chart than, than the ones at kind of the lowest level of the hierarchy or the most junior. So you have to, that, that's where it's a tool for the PM, not those folks, but you need to be able to have it so you can say, hey, here's what I've scheduled it for your folks, are you in agreement with this? Um, and, and somehow, whether it's one-on-one -on -one chats, daily meetings, weekly meetings, ad hoc, hey, let's just talk planning, where are we at? Um, having something that you can digest for them. Some people want that once a week update, some people don't. Um, yeah, it's a, you've got a diverse audience that you have to build that for. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think interesting. You're, and, and so in other words, MS project or, you know, by extension, the Gantt chart, uh, the man, the, the, our, our customers and managers don't want to see it. Right. And our team members don't want to see it. They, they don't. So they don't. it's the PM one. So it is basically, and, and again, not to, uh, you know, the, the message is not that we don't ever need them, but it's, it is the touchstone, I think, of, of the project manager, right. but, but not to expect a whole lot, a lot of other people to pour over it and, and marvel no. in the elegance of it. So you, you do have to, you do have to extrapolate out of it or extract out from it and some, and, and give it, you know, give different levels of granularity to different audiences based on, and, and so there can be, you can do all kinds of things with, it's a very rich tool, right? So you can filter it down, you can 
I can rip off all the tasks that are yours and show you, here's what you're doing in the next four months, right? right. So, so that side of it's important. But the other thing, and, and this is where, you know, again, I, I think that one of the struggles with, with a Gantt chart is there's an expectation in the waterfall world. You build your project plan at the beginning and you execute to it. And, and the, you know, even for a small project, that can be problematic because you can have something where you're not making a very big change, but it's a difficult change. It's conceptually hard or whatever, and you may have to try two or three attempts at it. So the, the notion that you, there's a phrase, you know, emergent architecture or emergent design, <laughs> which basically means we're making it up as we go. It's another way, right? And so you get in there and say, I wonder how I'm going to build this. And so, you know, you can allocate five days to design of a widget. And, and it may be that it isn't just that five, like you could design it three times in that five days, or it could be, no, it's two days, hand it over, developer builds it, give it to a tester, or give it to a user, and they go, ah, this, this doesn't really work. And then you're back to the beginning. So the notion of iterations, which is sort of the driver behind Agile saying, just keep trying it till you get it right, right? We, we tend not to write down the design and then do the development in a, an IT project. You tend to have your best people sort of trying to figure out the design by writing some code and going, ah, I think we'll do it this way. So right. I, I think that makes planning into a Gantt chart enormously difficult. So I like the notion that if you can get people to buy into, the details of the project will emerge over time. So whatever we're working on this week, the next couple of weeks, the next month, we have a pretty good handle on that probably. Beyond that, we don't. Let's not fake it. Right. Uh, and I agree. You're almost talking about, a, you know, whether it's agile or whether it's waterfall at a higher level. You're not yeah. trying to define what's happening at 2 a.m. on Friday afternoon. And then through, yeah. I, I, and I recall this goes back many, many years. This was early days in my, in my career. I remember having a you know, a spirited discussion, I'll even say an argument with my manager where my manager wanted me to map out the testing, this was of a, of a system, down to half days of yes. what we were going to be testing and retesting. And even at that, you know, I was in, I was just out of school, I was in my, 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 you know, mid 20s at that point. And even at that point, I said, well, this is nuts. Like, how, how can we know what I'll be doing testing a system three and a half weeks from now on Thursday afternoon. That, right. Nobody knows that. You, you know, People are still asking I, it, by the way. Yeah. Right. They're still <laughs> asking for it. Asked. And, and I remember saying, look, it's going to take, in this case, I think it was uh, three weeks. I was gonna, it's going to take us three weeks to test. Okay, it might take two and a half weeks. It might, worst cases, it'll take three and a half weeks. It's going to take right. us three weeks. Right. And, you know, that that's the, the endless battle <laughs> that... It is. I, and honestly, it's, it's, it's horrific. And it, one, one last comment I make about that is you can, you can kind of view planning as a top down or a bottom up. Like when a person's saying, no, I want you to figure out this, this little widget's a half day, this one's two days, this is three days. Fine. You could actually pretend and do that and say, so look, it's actually 33 and a half effort days of testing. When you have one resource, well, that's what, seven weeks, seven times five is 35, right? And they only work at 80% of the time. Now we're into, so that bottom up approach, you'll get a very granular project plan. I've had no success doing that because it's just those estimates get derailed. Um, I, I like the notion that you have some step up from that three weeks for this unit of testing. Yeah. Let's cross our finger, whether it's one or two passes or if it's fairly clean code. Um, and we adjust from that. And, and I've had lots of feedback from people at the senior management level, and even middle managers who are the practice managers that say, we can live with that. Like we, we like your approach there, we'll buy into it. So people have done it for enough time. They want to plan, they want to schedule. They, they don't want to say, oh, I've only got milestones six months apart or three months apart. You need something more granular for the next three months, but down to the half day or day is lunacy. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. So um, anyways, uh, Rich, this has been a great discussion. Uh, I thank you for your time and, um, and really bringing this sort of real world, uh, you know, view on scheduling. So uh, anyways, thanks again. And, uh, you know, uh, good luck on your future projects. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Glad to help.